Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pilots on the Fly. I am pilot Bob Dallas. No, I'm not a, an actual airline pilot, but I, I am a huge aviation enthusiast. And sharing the duties tonight as a, uh, um, as a co-host on the show, he's actually an enthusiast himself, and is, is, he is a actual airline pilot. He flies a 767, a Boeing for a cargo airline Captain Cartwright, welcome back. Hi, Bob. Thanks. Glad to be back. You know, you had such a great time the last time you were on the show. Word has it that you want to stick around for the next hundred years. Something like that. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to tell you something. I don't have any problem at all with that because I'm I'm in. I'm game. Yeah, definitely. I uh, I love the show, um, and uh, I'm glad you're uh, such an aviation enthusiast because I love sharing aviation and. Uh, that's what I'm all about. Well, th this is a lot of fun because when you get an aviation, two aviation enthusiasts with an actual pilot who's got the knowledge, well, that creates, you know, a lot of interesting content and it becomes very entertaining. So for you folks out there, uh, before I go any further, I want to give a shout out to the folks tuning in who are on TikTok right now, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and also on YouTube. Thanks, guys, for tuning in to what's going to be another great show. So we got Esther who's tuned in. Thank you so much, Esther, for being here. And I'm sure Esther's going to have a question or two for you, uh, James. So, uh, uh, you know, get ready for that. Uh, pilots are are seen as um, certain people who just like, this is what this perception is. But of course, it's wrong. You know, people think that a all a pilot's going to do is bring an airplane up to cruising altitude. And what's it like cruising altitude? sits back, relaxes, and that's it. All he's got to do is land the plane, but that's not the case. There's a lot going on, right? If I had a dollar for every time somebody asked me if the autopilot just flies the plane for us, I would be a rich man and already retired and wouldn't have to fly. Or I'd be flying my own jet, one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, they're actually talking about having pilotless aircraft, and I read that in a Forbes article, but that's for another show. That would definitely be sure, and I don't believe it in my lifetime. I hope to God not, because I always like to have someone up there who's in control of the situation. Or at least somebody on the ground that would be in control of the situation, too. You would not want a pilotless aircraft, period. Oh, my God, no. I'm just thinking about these trains that are operated. Uh, they're all automated, and there's no conductor inside. It's like, forget it. I'm not getting on that train. Well, let's think about it also uh, if for passenger hauling. I want somebody that's got some skin in the game. So, you know, just like when I'm flying an airplane, there's nobody that wants to survive anything that's going on in that airplane more than me. Oh, geez. So, you, you know, you guaranteed that I'm going to make sure that I survive as, as with every bit of skill that I can and, and knowledge. So, so uh, like we were saying, it gets busy up there. You have a lot of work to do. And sometimes it gets a little bit busier because there are certain circumstances like weather. And you, you were in a situation where you had to divert to uh, another airport. So tell us about the incident where you actually got to experience, folks, you heard it here first, snow in Hollywood. Talk to us about that incident. <laughs> yeah, I was actually flying a flight to uh, uh, LAX. I was flying the uh, western seaboard up and down north and south, uh, carrying cargo between a couple of different airports. And uh, trying to get into LAX in the middle of the night one night, and uh, there was a set of storms coming through. And uh, the storms uh, produce uh, quite a different, uh, as fronts come through, uh, can be very turbulent and cause a lot of issues. And typically that's uh, when a warm front and a cold front comes together. And on the tail end of this one was a cold front. And uh, I had to divert due to um, um, what's called wind shear. And uh, LAX closed down for... Uh, I know at least an hour. Um, they, I think it was closed down longer than that due to wind shear issues. So I uh, ended up diverting after holding for 30 minutes to uh, San Francisco. And uh, you are actually planning on an even other alternate airport just in case something went wrong with SFO. That is correct. Because uh, when I was listening on the radio and, no, and LAX closed and everybody was in the hold and um, luckily I had probably about an hour and a half of fuel left at the time when I landed, but, uh, particularly, um, 
when it becomes legal, you're uh, you're flying to the airport plus an alternate plus 45 minutes of hold time is your minimum required fuel. Now, that doesn't leave a whole lot of thinking if, say, for instance, LAX closes down and then uh, San Francisco, which is one of the closest, largest airports that everybody would typically divert from, from on the passenger side, much less cargo. Um, they all start diverting there and that airport has suddenly got an influx of airplanes that it can't handle. Wow. So it, it can become a very stressful job. So for all of you guys out there thinking that a pilot doesn't do much, think again. Well, think about it this way, Bob. Uh, you know, for instance, I've got an hour and say 30 minutes of fuel left. All right. And I've got to divert 30 minutes of travel from LEX from a hold to San Francisco and then get on the ground in San Francisco, which will probably take another 15 to 20 minutes. So from there, that's 30 to 45 minutes at least to get on the ground. So if, if we run into San Francisco and I've got an hour and a half of fuel left and I've only got 45 minutes just to get there left over after that, I've got to make a lot of decisions on where am I going to go after that if I can't get in? Because it could be a catastrophe that happens on the runway that closes that airport. Exactly. Or it could be um, I, that they just can't handle the influx and I have to call bingo fuel. And then, look. I've got to land somewhere. Either that, or I've got to go to the next closest alternate airport close to there. And I wanted to leave my options open. So that was some of the, just easily some of the calculations that you have to make really quick. Cause uh, in a 767, we're burning at altitude 10,000 pounds an hour. Wow. That's a 10, lot. Pounds. Wow. That th and I imagine that's just with two engines. That's and with that, just two engines. That's correct. That 747 it burns even more fuel than that. 747 has four engines just like the ones I have on the 7.6. So you're burning 20,000 an hour. Oh my God. Wow. Yes. So not only do you actually have to know about burning fuel and all that, um, a pilot is actually a meteorologist. You also have to be kind of a, a weatherman and you have this, um, this display here on one of your screens and you have to know what's going on. Uh, you, you know, like you don't want to go flying into a storm and all that. So by Looking at the device that I just showed on the screen right now, you can divert, either go higher, lower, or around the storm. Well, that gives us an idea of what it looks like in front of us from basically 45 degrees each way. And uh, as you saw on that picture, the red and the yellow, you want to avoid. The green, not so much. And, and sometimes we'll have to pick between those red and yellow areas to try to fly in between them. And ATC, we use all available resources, ATC on the ground, that we're talking to on the radio also has a ground radar, but they don't necessarily know how high these storms are. So some storms typically could be 30, 40,000 feet. If they've got a real high um, uh, build, they could be up to 40 something thousand feet, which could be higher than I fly. But typically they're around 20 to 30,000 feet at most. So and to help you know exactly uh uh, you know, to get the, the input on that screen and all that, this is the nose of the plane, folks, when it's opened up for, uh, this is an Airbus A330, it's a 300 uh, series, and you got this thing right here, which would be the weather radar, so Haas, elaborate on that for us. Yeah, sure, the uh, weather radar is encased in that nose cone there, which is typically fiberglass, because uh, fiberglass does allows the radio waves for the radar to go through it. Now, carbon fiber or metal, it would not allow them to go through. So they typically make the radomes out of fiberglass so that those radio waves that are trying to bounce off of those clouds that you need to get through will bounce through the fiberglass, but won't go through some of the other materials. So, but that also is what paints that picture for us so that we can see where we're going, especially in the dark. Because when we're flying cargo, um, you can't see at night. And it may be just pitch black out there and we could fly right into a storm. And it's very easy to get disoriented if you don't have your instruments working well. That is correct. Because we can get into this uh, on another uh, occasion, uh, but uh, there was actually some mud wasps uh, who um, blocked the pitot tubes on a 757 mm -hmm. and uh, actually caused the plane to crash, unfortunately. Yeah, and we have procedures for that in the cockpit called airspeed unreliable. Um, so that's a, that's a quick checklist that we actually run through to be able to make sure that we have enough airspeed to keep the aircraft in the sky. And um, 
it's a what we call a quick action uh, memory item or quick actions on the quick action card. So, for instance, if we have question about any one of our three uh, airspeed indicators, we'll call airspeed unreliable and we'll run through that checklist. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, we got asked, there was got a question here. What's the strangest thing you've seen in the sky during the flight? Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there's a lot of strange things you can see in the sky, and I think we're going to talk about some of that tonight. But uh, outside of that topic alone, I think um, it would definitely be the um, northern lights. The northern lights were beautiful, and I got to see them over Greenland when I was flying from uh actually coming back from the European countries over there to the back to the States. Wow. And that is a, such a beautiful phenomenon. What is it exactly that causes this, this uh, event, if you want to call it that, what, what causes that? Well, <laughs> I wish I'd have been prepared to talk about that, but uh, you know, it's still, it's kind of a mystery for me. It's um I know they talk about a lot of different things on how the lights kind of re can reflect off of the earth um, and, and bounce and stuff like that. Um, realistically, it is when you see it, it, it is nothing but heavenly uh, joy to be able to see that, wow. especially from the air. Now, I've, I've got a lot of friends that have seen it from the ground, but uh, I've seen it from the air myself and actually flown through it. And it's just it's a whole different picture. Wow, that, that is something that one day I would love to experience. Probably yeah. get, get into the jump seat on an airplane <laughs> one day. Well, maybe we can share some videos I have of it sometime. Oh yeah, that would be that would be a that's a must. I'm sure the audience is going to love that. There's another topic for us, right there. There you go. So the Northern Lights, Jenny, please take note of this and get back to us with that. <laughs> uh, so a, a lot of times with this, a lot going on because. Look at it this way, a flying a commercial airplane, there's no way that one person can do everything up there. And, and when things get a little busy, they get hectic, it's very good to have someone else helping you out. That's where crew resource management comes in. Yes, that is correct. And uh, all, all resources, you should be as a pilot at any time, um, whether you're on a ship, you're piloting a ship out in the middle of the ocean or you're piloting an aircraft, um, you're pretty much alone. You have certain resources, whether it be a radio or a satellite satcom or um, the person next to you that's helping you uh, pilot the ship or your crew or, or uh, for instance, the company or dispatch or maintenance that we could get a hold of either on a high frequency or ultra high frequency radio or sometimes even a sat phone. So depending on your resources, Every airplane could have a different resource. So you got to know your resource and how to use them to be able to use all available resources when it comes to crew resource management. And that includes my first officer that's sitting next to me. My first officer is my first line of crew resource management. But I could have a jump seater in the back seat back there that I may that I know is a pilot. And I may have to get him up into the cockpit and use him as a crew resource management um, as, as assistance. So any, all hands on deck when it comes to uh, anything that's, that could be a potential uh, hazardous event or an emergency. Speaking of strange things that you can see in the sky, UFO sightings. There's a lot of pilots out there who are afraid to come out and admit that they actually saw a UFO. Is this something that, uh, does it actually happen? Do pilots actually see UFOs while they're in flight? Well, I've seen un unidentified flying objects before. For. There's no question about that. I don't know what it was, but does it mean it was an extraterrestrial? Not necessarily. It could have been a weather balloon or it could have been some, uh, actually, when we first uh, initially uh, talked about UFOs, um, I was doing just a, uh, happened to click on something on uh, social media. And it was this guy talking about, it was a, a military jet jock. I'm going to just put him as, as that way. Uh -huh. And he was talking about how he would, um, create a UFO sighting with his military jet. So what he was explaining to me was he would take that jet, speed it up to about 600 miles an hour, just under the speed of sound. <laughs> and then he would uh, pull the throttle back to where it's silent. Cause when the airplane doesn't, is not putting out all that thrust, you can't really hear it when it's coming at you. So then he would pull it straight vertical. Then he would light off the afterburners 
And then you would see the afterburners go straight up in the air. Oh, wow. And uh, he said that would cause a lot of UFO sightings. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you one thing. And uh, I had a show on this back in the day when I was uh, hosting Rob's Inner Circle. I actually saw a UFO, guys. I, I had a UFO sighting. I was a bus driver back in the day. We're talking here. Yeah, there you go, Patty. Thanks. The 7th of November, 1994, I was driving my, my bus from the South Shore of Montreal into downtown Montreal, and there was this, all of a sudden, the, there was this cutoff. There was a huge source of light coming from up above, but the light looked so much different than, you know, the light posts we got out there. It was so bright, so clear. Even today's... Um, uh, LED lights that we have that, you know, emit like a 5,000 5, um, K color uh, temperature, which would be like daylight. It was even brighter and stronger than that. I never saw anything like that. Anyways, I was under this thing and I didn't realize it right away. But as I drove away and I was hearing on my radio, there's a UFO over class Bonaventure. And I had just parked my bus there. Anyways, I did three trips like that. And every time I was there, I was like really nervous. I couldn't wait to get out of there because I was afraid to get caught in the trap to me. <laughs> Anyways, you know, all I have to say, I actually experienced a UFO. Okay. I all didn't right. get to shake hands with the little green man, but I saw that craft and it was huge. They're probably all in Roswell, New Mexico. <laughs> Roswell, New Mexico. Hey, I mean, you want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Jenny saying, uh, Iceland and Greenland are great for seeing northern lights in winter. Due to their latitude and position of the Aurora Oval, some parts of Greenland, I guess, is a follow-up to that. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. That's uh, Again, that's where I saw it. And it was, uh, I believe it was February when I saw it. So it was the winter. It is in the winter time. Yeah. So to close off our show, I um, just wanted to talk about you know, how safe people can feel about flying in an airplane because they're they're on planes. You don't know they're there. You don't know which plane they're on. Uh, they're random. And these people would be? Oh, well, those people would be uh, through a program of what uh, we put together after 9-11. And um, air marshals is, would be the program that they would fall under. And that was that was initiated due to 9-11 because of the attacks that happened there. Um, now, the funny thing of it is, I just happened to look today, and the TSA is hiring air marshals from the 1st to the 20, uh, let's see, I think it was the 29th. They're, uh, they're hiring. So um, we have two types of air marshals that uh, usually can uh, fly on the aircraft, and that could be the cockpit air marshal, which is one of the pilots that actually carries or it could be a unidentified passenger in the back that actually carries during the flight. So it's a great program to help secure um, any threat that could happen like that to prevent 9-11 from ever happening again. Uh, do you think there are enough air marshals or should there be like even more? Well, what's your personal take on it? Well, obviously they're hiring, so there needs to be more. And, you know, the more the better, I think. Well, wow. and uh, the, the flight deck uh, marshal, uh, he's got a very specific role, which is different from the air marshal, right? He is, and uh, the flight deck marshal is a little bit different role because um, it is an actual pilot, and, and but nobody knows, um, including the first officer or the crew, uh, that he is an air marshal until that cockpit door closes. And then his first officer or whoever's in the cockpit at that moment will will uh be announced that he is a, a flight deck marshal and he will unholster his weapon out of the out of the container that it's in unlock it and he will wear that weapon throughout the flight wow that is amazing so talk about feeling safe when you're flying <laughs> yeah I, it's a it's a great program it definitely is and it, it could have prevented a lot uh for 9 11 as well is this uh, only in the U.S. or is this like uh, worldwide? From what I understand, it's only in the U.S. because uh, I know the flight deck um, air marshal program. Uh, I looked into uh, becoming one myself. And you can only carry your weapon while you're in the United, United States. If you're going out of the country, whether even Canada or Mexico, you have to put the weapon up 
um, and you can't carry it with you on that flight. As for air marshals, uh, this is again a U.S. thing only, or is that spread worldwide? I believe it's U.S. only, as far as the TSA's program. I'm not sure how other countries handle it. But, but then, again, we can't cross borders with any kind of weapon. Even though they may be an air marshal, they can't carry their weapon with them across borders. Captain Haas, you get the last word. The last word. Yeah, but closing off the show, that time, time, if it's part of the pun, time flies. <laughs> Time flies, definitely. Uh, well, you know, there's a, there's a whole lot to talk about, but uh, looking forward to the next show and a new set of topics. Um, and uh, definitely, let's add the Northern Lights to one of them because oh. uh, I would love to share some of that video and uh, uh, pictures that I took of that. Oh, Jim, okay. Please, by all means, please do have that for us. And the next show, we'll be glad to, to show the audience and have them uh, join in on the fun. Yeah, and I, I, there's actually another occurrence that I would like to share too, and uh, I'll – it's a, it's a definitely a phenomenon that happens to the aircraft when you go through some thunderstorms. Oh. Uh, but I, I will definitely uh, share some stuff with it, too, during that show as well. Um, so you're talking about strange things and scientific things. It's fun to look at. Uh, we'll, we'll show that as well. Wow, guys. So you have something to look forward to. We have another great show coming up. Definitely. I'd like to give a special thanks to Patty Saragoza for her skills as the um, – the techie here on the show. A big thank you to Jenny Duhame who produced the show. Thank you so much. Esther, thank you everybody for tuning in. All of you on TikTok, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and on YouTube. Thank you. And in the meantime, happy flying, Captain Cartwright. Thank you. And thank you all for showing up for our show. And uh, glad to show uh, or talk about aviation facts and uh, things that you might want to have a curiosity about. And if you do have questions, after the show, or you want to email us or, or text us, bring the questions out. We'd love to answer them. Um, and even if we don't have the answer, we'll find the answer. You can be sure of that. Captain, Captain Cartwright is always going to get you the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.